Good evening, folks. I'll give you a warm welcome to our worship service this Good Friday, the day that Christian believers remember down the centuries of when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary, taking a punishment not his own and paying the penalty for sin. We're gathered here to, to praise the Lord and to hear from his word. And we're going to be reading uh, from the Word of God. I'm going to read through uh, Matthew chapter 27. And we'll be singing praises to God our Saviour throughout. Before we do all that, let's just have a, a word of prayer. Lord God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, time where we can uh, gather to remember the fact that Jesus died for our sin and so Lord we we're here to worship you and to praise you uh, we, we thank you Lord that the, an event in history which might have looked like the end of uh, a good thing in terms of uh, people looking on and the disciples maybe uh, really wondering what on earth was supposed to happen and uh, we have the privilege as your believers today and disciples today of being able to look back and seeing that although Friday took place, Sunday was coming. And so Lord, we just really pray that we, as we praise you tonight, as we lift our hearts and our voices, that you might receive all the glory and the honour, and that Jesus, uh, our Saviour, our Lord, might be glorified tonight. And so we just commit our time to you now as we hear from your word, as we sing your praise, and as we uh, just hand this over to you lord we just pray that you might be honored and continue with us now in jesus name amen so we're reading from chapter 27 of matthew's gospel throughout uh, various different uh, past uh, verses uh, and interspersed we'll have some songs as well so let's begin our time of reading now from verse 11 through to 23. matthew chapter 27 starting at verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas? Or Jesus, who is called Christ, for he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. Amen. We're going to have our time of praise we begin now as we sing this song come see the beauty of the lord come see the beauty of the lord
going to continue in Matthew's Gospel, now at verse 24 through to 31. Verse 24. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. We're going to continue in our time of praise now as we sing the song, Come and See, Come and See.
continue in our reading, uh, Matthew 27, of course, and we're now at verse 32 through to 44. Verse 32. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. We're going to continue in our time of praise as we sing of the, the prophecy from Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. So we're going to sing the song, He was pierced for our transgressions, the prophecy from Isaiah 53 of the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Now at verse 45. 
Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Lima Shabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Amen. Let's just have a, a word of prayer. Lord God and loving Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that it's because of what Jesus accomplished at Calvary that we are even able to call you our Heavenly Father. And so Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he went all the way to Calvary. He allowed what took place at Calvary to happen to him. We thank you for that, Lord, because it's a pivotal point in history. A change had taken place. And Lord, we thank you that it affects us for all eternity. And so, Lord, we thank you that our sins have been taken away. We thank you that the punishment was laid on Jesus, that we might uh, escape that punishment when we trust in your Son. And so, Lord, we pray for Rod now as he comes and shares from this passage. And we pray, Lord, that he might know that, that fresh touch from God on high as he points us now to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we trust that you continue with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening uh, as we gather together on Good Friday to bring God's Word. We'd just like to thank Mark for uh, reading the scriptures from Matthew chapter 27. And as we come to this time of worship, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord and Heavenly Father, as we open up your word this evening, may by your Holy Spirit, you would bring new truths into our hearts that we would recognise all that you did for us on that Friday, that time where you were taken to the cross, nailed to it, and gave up your life for us. What a humbling thought we have as we come before the King who was crucified because of the sin of mankind. And Lord, we thank you that you did that which set us free from the bondage of sin, and that through your sacrificial death, we can come into your presence now. For you have given us life, eternal life, everlasting life. And so as we come to worship you this evening, May our hearts be with you, may our hearts be transformed by you, and that you would bring the word into a, a real and meaningful message to us this evening. Lord, bless us abundantly as we turn to your word now, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, Barabbas, a sinner set free by Jesus, our chain breaker. In Luke's Gospel, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has set me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set a liberty those who are oppressed. Jesus came to set the captives free. And that's why it is called Good Friday, because Jesus has released us from the bondage of sin. He has given us a way to lead us from our sinful natures. Luke was quoting from Isaiah 61, and Isaiah's words are about to be set in motion. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you said. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and the elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. The Jewish leaders had brought Jesus to Pilate and accused him of promoting himself as a king. They wanted uh, to portray Jesus as a dangerous revolutionary against the Roman Empire. And Pilate asked Jesus this simple question, are you the king of the Jews? Was Pilate being sarcastic? Was he looking at this man standing before him and he, he was being inquisitive saying, are you the king of the Jews? Or was he being sincere? Are you king of the Jews? And Jesus was silent before his accusers. So many times we want to jump to our own defence when we are falsely accused. But we would usually be better off to keep silent and to let God defend us. Jesus remained silent. Pilate was wanting to get himself out of this predicament. He was between a rock and a hard place. He was wanting to get off the hook. In verse 15 it says, Now at the feast the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted and they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Pilate hoped so this custom of releasing a prisoner might help solve the problem that he was facing. Barabbas was what we would call a revolutionary terrorist. He was notorious, a well-known insurrectionist, a murderer with no good in him. And Jesus took his place. Let's imagine uh, Barabbas in a dark prison cell with a small window waiting to be crucified. Through the window he could hear the crowds gathering before Pilate, not far from where he was being imprisoned. Perhaps he could not hear Pilate ask, which of these do you want me to release? But surely he heard the crowd shout, Barabbas! 
He probably could not hear Pilate's ask, what then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? But he certainly heard the crowd's response. Let him be crucified. If all Barabbas heard from his cell was his name shouted by the mob, then the let him be crucified. When the Roman soldiers came to his cell, he surely thought his time was up. But then the soldiers said to him, Barabbas, you're a guilty man, but you will be released because Jesus will die in your place. Barabbas, you are a guilty man, but you will be released because Jesus will die in your place. Perhaps then we could say that about ourselves. Rod, you're a guilty man, but you will be released because Jesus will die in your place. What a thought this Good Friday to realize that Jesus is going to take our place. We are guilty as charged. We are sinners found short of the glory of God. Barabbas would know the full meaning of the cross better than most. And we don't know what happened to Barabbas afterwards. We don't know how he was affected by this afterwards. But he would have known that he got away and he wouldn't be crucified. Do you know the release that Jesus has given you from your sin. Now Pilate sees this as his last chance to settle things down. In verses 19 and 20 it says, Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent a word to him. Have nothing to do with this righteous man. For I've suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, as Pilate sat in judgment of Jesus, he failed to give the accused justice. Pilate had all the evidence he needed to do the right thing. To release Jesus. He saw the strength and dignity of Jesus and he knew this was no criminal or revolutionary. He knew that it was a false charge that brought Jesus before his judgment seat and it was only the envy of the religious leaders. He saw that Jesus was a man so at peace with his God that he didn't need to answer a single accusation. He had already declared Jesus an innocent man. He'd said, I find no fault in this man. In addition to all these, Pilate also had his wife's dream. Perhaps she saw Jesus, an innocent man, crowned with thorns and crucified. Maybe she saw him in clouds of glory. Maybe she saw him at the great white throne of judgment and she and her husband facing Jesus. We don't know what was in her dream, but there was great urgency about her message. Let him go. Have nothing to do with this righteous man for I have suffered much because of him today in my dream. The religious leaders knew the best way to influence Pilate and the best way was to combine the voice of the mob. Pilate was frightened of an uprising 
since he had previously previous issues with the Jews that had resulted in him getting into trouble with Rome. The governor answered and said to them, which of these two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. The crowd demands the release of Barabbas and the crucifixion of Jesus. When the crowd chose Barabbas instead of Jesus, it reflects on the fallen nature of humanity. The name Barabbas means son of the father. They chose a false, violent son of the father instead of the true son of the father. Can we see here a glimpse of the substitutionary atonement in these circumstances? One who was guilty, one who was a sinner, one who was notorious, a murderer. No righteousness in him was substituted by the one who knew no sin. And we see what happens on the cross where Jesus takes upon himself the sin of a guilty man. The sin of guilty mankind. And in exchange, he lays upon his righteousness upon that sinner. And with the sin that is upon him, he pays the punishment for that sin. God's wrath was poured out upon Jesus in the stead of guilty man. And for us to experience that substitution, we need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin and accept it for ourselves personally. People still reject Jesus today and choose another. Maybe you're one of them. Their Barabbas might be their career, their finances, their Barabbas might be their family or their hobbies or their fitness. It could be their addictions, alcohol, sex, drugs or indeed eating too much. What are you choosing above Jesus? We reject Jesus when we place anything in preference to him. When the soldiers said, Barabbas, you are a guilty man, but you will be released because Jesus will die in your place. Barabbas knew the meaning of the cross better than most. But do we know this for ourselves? Do we mean, know the meaning of the cross in our own lives? Not just an intellectual understanding, but a heartfelt acceptance of the cross. Pilate was trying to avoid the responsibility for Jesus. He was boxed in and he washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of this man's blood, see to it yourselves. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Jesus is then beaten and mocked. In verse 27, the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him and they stripped him 
and put a scarlet robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put on his own clothes and led him away to be crucified. Mocking him, the soldiers were saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Everything about this was intended to humiliate Jesus. The Jewish rulers had already mocked Jesus for being the Messiah. And now the Roman powers mock him as king. They stripped him to increase his humiliation. They put a scarlet robe on him as a cruel irony. They twisted a crown of thorns that cut and pierced into his head, blood trickling down his face. They placed a reed in his right hand as a scepter. They bowed the knee before him, offering him mock worship. Hail, King of the Jews. Even through this, Jesus stood in the place of sinners, stood in the place of rebellious man, stood in the place of selfish mankind, wanted to be king. You see, that's the human problem. We want to rule our own lives, but we're foolish in thinking we have autonomy as we are bound in our sin and captives of our own will. Jesus endured the mocking to be a sacrifice to set mankind free. If we would only bow the knee to King Jesus. Are you willing this Good Friday to bow the knee to King Jesus? and accept him for the forgiveness of your sin and for salvation. Submit to him now and know that freedom in Christ. Is it possible for us to mock Jesus today in the way in which we live? Have we mocked and insulted him even in our ritualistic religious services? going through the motions with no heart in it? Do we bring him adoration that is no adoration? Do we confess with no confession and pray that is not a prayer? When Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is exactly the scene he had in mind. Everyone knew that the cross was an unrelented instrument of death. The cross wasn't about religious ceremonies. It wasn't about tradition and spiritual feelings. The cross was a way to execute people. But we have sanitized and ritualize the cross. How would we take it if Jesus said, walk down death row daily and follow me? Taking up your cross wasn't a journey. It was a one-way trip. There was no return ticket. It was never a round trip. When we are called, there is no turning back. Jesus was on his way to Golgotha, to Calvary Hill, to be crucified. The Bible spares us the gory detail 
of Jesus' physical agony. Just simply stating, then they crucified him. This is because everyone in Matthew's day was well acquainted with the terror of crucifixion. But we are spared that because the greater aspect of Jesus' suffering was spiritual, not physical. It is significant to remember that Jesus did not suffer as the victim of circumstances. He was in control. Jesus said in John chapter 10, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. It is terrible to be forced to endure such torture, but to freely choose it out of love is remarkable. Can we ever rightly doubt God's love for us ever again? Has he not gone to the most extreme length to demonstrate that love to us? Will you open your arms right now and accept that love that cost so much. Now is the time to put aside your selfish desires and cast yourself upon God, who became flesh and died for you. Take his hand now and enter into his eternal glory. May you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour this Good Friday. May you trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins. May you come to know him and trust in him and walk with him all the days of your life and for all eternity. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you how real that scene is. Barabbas, a guilty man, a sinner, substituted for uh, by a sinless man, Jesus. How Jesus takes upon our sin upon himself in order to break the chains of bondage that hold us and bind us so closely. Lord, we thank you that you made that choice to go to the cross, to give up your life so that we can have life in you. May we know the reality of that. May we know the relationship that that gives us with the risen Christ, especially this Easter time when there is so much uncertainty of the future. When we look at this virus that is uh, passing through our countries worldwide, may we know and trust in the God of all things. The one who sent his son to die upon a cross to be an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. And so as we come this evening, we trust in you for all things. And we ask for your hand to be upon us, to protect us and bless us, so that we can be obedient servants to the risen King. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we're going to conclude by Mark and Tina leading us in worship for our final hymn. Thank you, Rod. Yes, the, the closing hymn that we're about to sing is my lord what love is this
thank you that Jesus died that we might live and we just want to give him all the honour and the glory now in Jesus' name. Amen.